If you're new to this channel, you may consider subscribing and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. Please share it with all others who might benefit. Let's get started. So often while solving a classification type of supervised machine learning problem, we come across a challenge that how do we know we got the optimal results? And end of it, results always matter. In this video, we're trying to address the same concern that you very commonly come across while trying to solve classification problems. So let's get a bit of a background. In a supervised learning problem, you're always given some actual labels or the ground truth labels, which are the known results or the outcomes. This could be a binary or a multi-class problem, but we are taking an example of a binary scenario where we have zeros and ones as the outcomes. Let's say the class of interest is one, which is talking about a bank reaching out to some prospects for an additional product. So one means the customer or the prospect they approached actually subscribed for the additional offer. Zero means the prospect declined the offer. This could be anything. You could be detecting a disease and the presence of disease is one and the absence of it is zero. You could be trying to look for a default prediction where the event of default is one and the non-default is zero. You get the idea. Most of the models do not directly predict the classes, they predict the probabilities. So if you were looking at the outcome of the model, it will be a value ranging between zero to one, which is how the probabilities are. Then how do we get classes? So in most of these scikit-learn algorithms, there is a rule that works. The rule basically is that you compare the predicted probability with the threshold of 0.5. And if the predicted probability is greater than the threshold of 0.5, which is the default, you predict the class as one. If not, then you predict the class as zero. So for this example, let's understand how do we generate the predicted classes. So wherever the values of the predicted probability exceeds 0.5, we call it a one. And rest everywhere, it is zero. So if you see, this class that we got now as our prediction largely depends on the value of this threshold of 0.5. But the question that arises is, how do we know if this threshold itself is right? Because 0.5, if you studied probability, you would know is typically a coin toss probability when you're talking about a head versus tail. How do we know this 0.5 is the right threshold for all sort of problems that we are facing? The answer to this comes in the form of Uden's J statistic or Uden's index. This was proposed back in the 1950s, but it's quite handy even today when you're solving the machine learning problems and you're struggling to get the optimal results. So let's see how does it work. We need to do a quick recap of the ROC curve. If you see this ROC curve is basically representing the true positive rate or the recall on the y-axis and the false positive rate or the one minus specificity as we call it on the x-axis. The definitions of true positive rate and false positive rate are written here. The true positive rate is nothing but true positive divided by true positive plus false negative. It implies what proportion of the actual ones were identified correctly. And false positive rate talks about what proportion of the actual zeros or the other class were misclassified. We've done separate videos on confusion matrix as well as the ROC curve. You may refer to those videos if you need necessary foundation. But if you're comfortable with these terms, we may proceed to Uden's index. What is the Uden's index? So the Uden's index is given by true positive divided by true positive plus false negative, which is nothing but TPR, plus true negative divided by true negative plus false positive minus one. Now we will simplify this to a known term very soon, but let's just take it the way it is right now. So this J statistic ranges between a negative one to a positive one, both inclusive. Let's look at the extreme cases when this value would be a plus one or a negative one. So let's say if our model is perfect, which means a false negative and false positives both are zeros. Let's put these values in this formula and try to do the calculations. So if we replace the false negatives and false positives with zeros, you will get this as the outcome. Now you know you have true positive divided by true positive plus zero, which is nothing but true positive. So this value becomes one. And you have this true negative divided by true negative plus zero, which is nothing but true negative. So true negative by true negative is again one. So you have one plus one and you're doing a minus one. So this value is one now. In case of a perfect model, the value of J statistic is one. 
That's what it implies. So now what happens at the other extreme? Let's say our true negatives and true positives both are zero. Let's put these values as zeros in this formula and let's try to understand. So we have zero divided by zero plus a quantity and zero divided by zero plus another quantity. Now, if you do these calculations, obviously this will turn out to be zero. This will also be turned out to be zero. So you're doing zero plus zero minus one. That'll be a negative one. So now you see J statistic would always lie between negative one to one, moving from a perfectly erratic model to a perfectly accurate model. But let's spend a little more time on this J statistic and understand how does it actually help us get the optimal result. So if you focus on this portion of the J statistic, can we rearrange this? If I just take this portion, true negative divided by true negative plus false positive minus one, you would see this will turn out to be negative of false positive divided by true negative plus false positive. You can solve this on your own. Now, if you see, this is exactly the TPR or the true positive rate, and this is exactly the false positive rate that we have. So if you see, J statistic is talking about the difference between TPR and FPR. Once again, what is TPR? TPR is the model's ability to identify the ones correctly. And FPR is an error which talks about what proportion of the class zero were misclassified. Won't you get the best of both the worlds if your true positive rate is the highest and the false positive rate is the lowest? Well, that's exactly the optimal point. So we are looking for that point on the ROC curve, that threshold on the ROC curve at which the difference between TPR and FPR is maximized. Now let's also see how this is visually represented on a plot. So if this is your ROC curve, and let's say for argument's sake, this is the best threshold, then your J statistic is nothing but the difference in the height of that point on the ROC curve to the line which represents a model which is totally random. If you remember, this dashed green line represents a perfectly random model, which has a 50-50 chance of making the correct predictions. So this line, this difference essentially represents the J statistic. If you want to see how this works in the form of code and how do we really estimate it for a given data, you may refer to our video on the ROC curve. The last few minutes talk about the hands-on aspect of this Uden's index piece, where we calculate the R max of the difference between TPR and FPR and that's the right threshold that you should be working with rather than working with a threshold of 0.5, which is the default threshold. It does make a difference. Hope this helps.